is only week three. The reality is, is uh, that not, none of his behavior, which can best be described as performative, will change what's happening in the courtroom. We are here to enforce the law, and nothing will change that. No attacks, no words. I will not give in. I will not give up. I will only serve justice and enforce the law. Thank you. Yeah, you, right. you, you know who that is. Yeah, that is someone's a, very confident. somebody smiling. That's yeah. somebody holding four aces while the person across the table is screaming and yelling. She went on to say uh, with it's a, with quite a, clear a, in the evidence that straight. he yeah. overvalued his properties. Well, she, I, I say she's holding four aces because she's holding <laughs> years and years and years of lies. This is part of uh, Attorney General's uh, civil fraud trial against Donald Trump, Letitia James. Inside the courtroom, the judge reportedly had to tell Trump to quiet down after prosecutors say the former president's comments were heard across the courtroom during a witness's testimony. According to the AP, the judge then asked the entire room to keep their voices down, quote, particularly if it's meant to influence the testimony. Trump returned to the courtroom this week after attending the first days of the fraud trial against him earlier this month. You know, Willie, it is so sad. It is so sad what they are doing. Yeah. To the, poor Donald Trump says he's being forced. He's being dragged in there. To attend this trial. He's forced because <laughs> they don't want him to go to Iowa. It's so unfair, he says. Take a look and see. You can't campaign. See if you can find the inconsistency. So I want to keep you here in the state of Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and lots of other great places. They want me to be here. And will you be back tomorrow by any chance? Probably not. Uh, uh, probably we're having a very big uh, tournament, professional golf tournament yes, sir. at Durrell, so probably not. Uh, so Willie, perfection. Oh they're keep, Love it. They're keeping oh my God. me. They're keeping me from the good people of Iowa. Four minutes. They're keeping me from the, the good people of New Hampshire. Information. They're keeping me from the good people of South Carolina. I mean, he almost did a Howard Dean rundown of the states that they were keeping him from. It's so the injustice of it all. How could they be? To, and then the reporters ask him a couple of minutes later. So you're going to be here tomorrow too, since they're holding you here. Oh, no, I got a golf tournament in Doral. I'm going down to the country club. <laughs> I mean, you, you couldn't. Can't, you, you can't make it up because, see, yeah. it's mine. He can't even we remember can't who he's on. running against. He thinks he's running against Barack Obama. So how do you expect him four minutes later to remember the lie he told four minutes ago? I mean, it's perfection. You couldn't rest. Sometimes you, things are bleak. I get it. But sometimes mm -hmm. you just have to laugh. I mean, it's, it's absolute perfection. There is, Joe, that famous waiver in the New York court system. You have to be here as a defendant unless there's a tournament at Doral. And yeah. so many defendants yeah. have invoked that over the years. So he's just well, yeah, taking advantage of, of it. You know, yeah. and, and I, think he, I think even Chicago, Al Capone, said uh, <laughs> that he had to go to the Chicago Invitational uh, <laughs> in, instead of Jonathan O'Meara going to his court day. But no, this is, this is again, you talk about the lies, the, the, the transparent lies that are fed by Hamas to the Arab street. You look, you look at the transparent lies here. They're, they're kindergarten level, Jonathan Lemire, and, 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 and Trump knows they're, they're kindergarten there level. Hey. There he is. Okay. <laughs> I knew we'd get him sooner or later. And, and yet, again, he, he, and this lie, by the way, is being spread uh, by Trump allies in the media. Oh, they're doing this to keep him away from the campaign. They're doing it. No, they're not. He doesn't have to be there. He wasn't there for his trial where the judge said he raped a woman. But he's he's at this trial because he knows he's busted. And yet he's so held down there that when his country club in Miami has a golf tournament, he goes, oh, no, 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 I'm going out to the golf tournament. Mm. They will not keep him from the good people at Doral, uh, which <laughs> I right. reminded yeah. that he proposed as a site for the G7 while he was in office because it was oh so conveniently God. located. It was so conveniently located next to the Miami International Airport. Um, oh, but I think the, the actually course. only consistency here between Trump showing up to the courthouse from other days, but not this one, 
is because it's all about his money. And the golf tournament is one of the few sources of income he currently has. Uh, we are seeing here uh, that, you know, he's inflated his assets. He's already been, you know, found guilty of that in a civil sense. And we're now we're in the penalty phase of this of this trial. Uh, you know, and he is going to probably take a real beating and have a lot of money he has to pay away. Uh, you know, so therefore golf tournaments whether it's live or otherwise, uh, at Doral or Bedminster or any of the other places are some of the few uh, that he's still going to be able to, to make money from. And let's also recall, of course, he is, there's a chance he's going to lose his ability to make money to practice any businesses in New York State. Well, Doral's in Florida. So therefore, that's another reason why he can actually still uh, raise, raise a few bucks along the way. Well, and of course, the, the, the question really, Mika, that mm -hmm. observers of Donald Trump's uh, business over the past dec several decades, the question that they're asking is, regardless of, of what his valuation, what he says his valuations are, which are, of course, we found out inflated because he's already been found guilty of fraud in New York State. The question is, if he's fined the $250 million that he could be fined, right. there's a real question on whether he has that money to even pay them back. It, yeah, that would be that would be interesting if he did. Let's put it that way. Come no. <laughs> Zero. None. I ache for him. President Biden's sarcastic reaction when asked about Jim Jordan's bid for the speakership. Congressman Jordan lost his second vote in pursuit of the speaker's gavel, receiving just 199 votes yesterday, the first time in nearly a century <laughs> that a majority party's nominee for speaker has failed to get 200 votes. So Republicans keep making history. Yeah. The Ohio congressman is vowing to continue his bid, telling reporters there will be another vote today. Nancy Pelosi yeah. was actually very complimentary of the Republican Party yeah. for mm -hmm. uh, not electing an election denier and someone well, who was directly connected I, I, to January 6th. She thought it was a good day for democracy. A good, it was a good day. And, you know, Willie, uh, again, he keeps he says he's going to keep voting. He keeps losing votes. Like I said, maybe, you know. Maybe he ends up with a handful of votes, hound dog barking for him outside the chamber, but nobody else speaking out for him. What's interesting is you have a number of, of different factions that are now voting against him. And one thing that I, I particularly taking note of, some institutionalists, people that mm -hmm. I even serve with, Kay Granger, who runs the Appropriations uh, Committee and who, of course, wants an orderly process like, you know, we haven't really seen in Congress, you know, in, in a very long time. You know, it, it sounds very boring, regular order. But if you're the appropriations chairwoman, you want you want to see bills get through there in a way that funds the government, that funds the agencies that do the things that Congress is expected to do. And when you have an institutionalist like Kay Granger voting against him, and other institutionalists, that's her saying, I don't think he's up to it. I, you know, you guys kicked out Kevin McCarthy for this. And uh, so it's interesting. I, I, I expect the numbers will probably grow. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. If they go to another vote today, which they're supposed to, he's going to lose more votes. We've got more Republicans on the record than voted for him yesterday, now saying they'd vote him against him. And imagine that, Joe, you have some institutionalists who actually want to get budgets through and get things yeah. done. Another How thing that doesn't them. work is threatening and bullying Republican members whose votes oh, you would like to get. Some God. of them came out publicly yesterday and said, hey, Jim Jordan and your allies, stop calling and threatening us. Stop having Fox News hosts and their producers calling and threatening us and saying you're taking names. Some members even said there have been security threats to their families because mm. they haven't committed to vote for Jim Jordan. That doesn't work either. Let's bring in congressional investigations reporter for The Washington Post, Jackie Alamany. Jackie, good morning again on this. Uh, we're going to get another round of vote today, we think. How's it going to go for Jim Jordan? Yeah, good morning, Willie. Well, I have to say Joe is spot on. You are seeing the institutionalists bite back, giving these hardline Republicans a taste of their own medicine. Jim Jordan has said he's going to hold another vote today. He told us that yesterday after we were anticipating a third vote yesterday afternoon, but he's been unable uh, to get his numbers down and lock in and, and flip some more yeses. And, and we heard from a range of members across the board, um, people, again, in the New York delegation, 
delegation, these institutionalists, appropriators, um, a, a range of people who are not necessarily united by any straightforward thing, but who sort of organically developed and, and gravitated towards uh, this building coalition against Jim Jordan, who have said that, that one, they want to get back to regular order and they don't think this is the way. And then two, they're against sort of the culture that Jim Jordan has fostered and, and helped facilitate during his time in Congress that has now taken over the GOP, this sort of knife fighting, toxic, um, win at all costs approach that has has essentially uh, destroyed any sort of hopes of bipartisanship in in the House of Representatives. Um, you have members who, uh, you know, have said, as you just noted, that they've gotten threats against their staff, their wives um, themselves, and that this and that Jordan is squarely responsible for this. That is what John Rutherford and Steve Womack told us yesterday. And that uh, the they called the opposition against Jordan profound. That meaning, you know, unlike those 20 members who were against Kevin McCarthy at the outset in January when he went through 17, uh, 14 rounds of, of trying to be, get elected speaker, they all wanted something. This time around, these members don't want anything. They just don't want Jim Jordan. So we're going to see what happens here. There is some truth to this idea that Jim Jordan doesn't necessarily want to go on the floor and lose again, which is what is likely going to happen. Um, we haven't heard of any significant uh, people flipping in Jordan's favor right now. Um, so we're all sort of waiting on a potentially um, uh, interim speaker, McHenry. But for that process to get started, you're going to have to see Jordan uh, throw up the white flag. So, Jackie, mm -hmm. as Jordan wrestles with this profound opposition, um, walk us through what could happen next, whether he pulls his name or let's say he goes to the floor and, and takes a vote. How many votes are they going to give him? Are we going to see a McCarthy-style 15-round extravaganza? At what point do is there a push to go in another direction? And you mentioned McHenry. There seems to be some momentum there. How could that play out? Yeah, so there are a number of different ways this could play out. Right now, it does seem, though, that this is the ball is in, in Jim Jordan's court. He does, at the end of the day, have, um, you know, uh, not a simple majority, but a majority of, of support. And he is still trying to work over people, despite this entrenched opposition. Um, and so members are sort of waiting on him to, to make the call of what's going to happen next, whether that's um, pulling down, you know, the race altogether, saying that he's out. He's he's uh, he's you know giving up. He realizes he's not going to be speaker, or it's deferring things to this resolution that David Joyce introduced yesterday to elect temporarily Speaker McHenry into the position for about roughly 80 days to January, and kicking the ball kicking the can down the road to then running for speaker again, trying to, you know, split the difference, make up some votes in the course of the next few months and jumping back in in January once McHenry's term, interim term, expires. Um, we spoke with uh, various members yesterday on the House floor as they were in and out of the chamber uh, during this second vote, and we heard from some Democrats who said that they've been in touch with Dave Joyce and some of these um, Republicans who have been scheming and coalescing around this McHenry resolution who said that that they're in they want to get back to work there are some obviously very urgent matters at hand while the world is on fire and they're struggling to elect a speaker but that what they would need to see for them to actually uh, take that next step to vocally supporting um, the McHenry resolution is again for Jim Jordan to bail and then um, to, to move forward in some sort of way at the lead of Republicans all right, the Washington Post, Jackie Alamany, as always. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Really, um, you, if you were a Democrat, you could not create, you could not write a script to show how MAGA Republicans are less suited to govern this country than, well, what Donald Trump did for four years, but also what they're doing in the House and how ineffective they are legislatively while you have the Middle East blowing up, you have Central Europe blowing up, uh, you have, uh, have the government possibly shutting down agencies that Americans depend upon not being opened up. I mean, we, we're, we, the clock is ticking. And again, it, it bears repeating to say this is the first time I believe ever that You've had the speakership vacant 
because a political part, a political party can't even elect a speaker. And the crazy thing here is they've been held hostage by six, seven, eight members. Yeah. That's why we're here. Six, seven, four percent of the caucus. So I will say it again. I understand we live in a partisan age, but damn it. Get some Democrats to work with you, do a deal, and roll over those eight people. Even if you put McCarthy back in there, find Democrats, do a deal, roll over these people, and send a message to everybody in the House that this is never going to happen again, that the People's House cannot be held hostage politically by 4% of a caucus. Have what you have what you need to protect your people to defend your nation. For decades, we've ensured Israel's qualitative military edge. And later this week, I'm going to ask the United States Congress for an unprecedented support package for Israel's defense. President Biden speaking yesterday in Tel Aviv about America's commitment to Israel and the historic levels of military aid he plans to request now from Congress. The White House expected to ask Congress tomorrow for an additional $60 billion for Ukraine and $40 billion in funds for Israel, Taiwan, and for the southern border with Mexico. Joining us now, Republican Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana. Last weekend, he joined a bipartisan group of senators on a visit to Israel, meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, President Isaac Herzog, and other members of the newly created Israeli War Cabinet. Senator, thanks for being on with us. So uh, I mentioned the political leaders you met with, but importantly, you met with families of Israeli hostages uh, being held inside Gaza, more than 200 of them, we believe, there now. Can you share with us some of those conversations and what you learned from the trip? Incredibly powerful. These were American Israelis whose family members were being held hostage. As you might guess, they're incredibly emotional um, uh, and obviously one of the best for their family. Um, they, they, they really are looking forward to looking towards the United States. They, they're very disappointed with their political and uh, uh, military leadership for being caught so off guard. Uh, by the way, one of the uh, political leaders said it is the responsibility of the state to keep Israelis safe, and they had failed. So there's a kind of acknowledgement of that. And they are looking to the United States, these family members of hostages. Uh, one said, you're like our big brother. We need your protection right now. And there was nothing manipulative. They were just laying out their heart. Their family members are captive. One more thing. There are several so touching things, but one, she showed a video of the 12-year-old. Um, the video had been taken by Hamas and posted online, just being led away. And he had this kind of smooth face of a 12-year-old, kind of, you know, has never understood kind of how terrible things could happen. And, and the child was being led away. One more, I just can't help myself. Uh, she spoke about how her son, I believe it was, or her nephew, had his arm shot off. It had been witnessed. He was taken away by Hamas. She said, it is unimaginable that the good news is that the boy has had his arm shot off and that he's being held captive in Gaza by Hamas. But the good news is, is that he is alive. Uh, it is something that most of us cannot imagine. No, I can't imagine any of this. The, 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 the horrors that the Israeli people experienced and the stories that you witnessed had to be so heartbreaking. Uh, Senator, I'm, I'm wondering while you were there, did you and your delegation get any insight into how it could be that those Israeli citizens had to wait four, five, six hours uh, for the military to come? And 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 rescue rescue some of them. Uh, any any insight into this massive security failure that goes against everything I know that you and I and most Americans have ever believed about Israel's capability mm -hmm. to protect their people. There was a sense that Hamas was actually evolving into a governing body as opposed to a terrorist organization. Uh, the Israelis have put two-thirds of their forces on the northern border, uh, fearing an uh, attack from uh, Hezbollah more than uh, an attack from Hamas. In fact, one of the men we spoke with, Benny Gantz, uh, briefly the prime minister, had actually opened up uh, to allow 19,000 
uh, Palestinians a day to come in and work in Israel with the idea that they would return back to Gaza and help improve the economy. Uh, so this was a, a strategy to begin to open up the two economies and to allow, uh, if you will, an unleashing of the potential of the Palestinian people. Uh, unfortunately, the Hamas took that as an opportunity to prepare for war. One thing that's kind of a metaphor for this, there was a kibbutzim uh, near the border of people who were committed to peace, Israelis committed to peace. They were teaching their children both Arabic and Hebrew. Uh, the the Hamas terrorists specifically targeted this kibbutzim. Uh, a metaphor, if you will, they were there not just to kill Jews, but also to kill the, the possibility of peace. Well, and, and can you underline that fact? And it, it's such a horrible story, but can you underline the fact that, um, that Hamas uh, sees actually those who would try to understand the Palestinian people in Israel and try to forge alliances, they see them as the greatest threat. I mean, you look at their founding documents, they talk about their goals to, to, to murder Jews and to not make peace with Israel. Um, can you can you talk more about that and also talk about what the United States policy should be regarding Israel's attempt to uproot Hamas? Well, so first, as regards the, the, the first point, uh, Hamas sees that as their mission, not the protection of the Palestinian people and certainly not the Israelis. Uh, I say that because it was pointed out that the Israelis were dropping leaflets asking Palestinians to evacuate Gaza City because they knew they were going to destroy it or bomb it or whatever. And Hamas was trying to keep the Palestinians there, blockading roads. We saw pictures of these blockades not allowing the, 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 the retreat, if you will, from Gaza City. As somebody pointed out, the Palestinians are trying to protect, I'm sorry, the Israelis were trying to protect the Palestinians. The Hamas was trying to use the Palestinians to protect themselves. There is a difference between Hamas and the Palestinians. As regards U.S. policy, we need to be with Israel, number one. We need to support them. We need to give them that which they need. But one thing that the Israelis emphasize, they want humanitarian aid to go to the Palestinians. They are differentiating be between Hamas and the Palestinians. There will be Palestinians and civilians that die. Um, that is a tragedy. But it is in large measure because Hamas has invited us upon Gaza, and they are using Palestinians as human shields. But the, but the Israelis were specifically asking, from the military and the political leadership, for humanitarian aid. The United States should do what it can, do what it, it can, to not just arrange for it to be delivered, as we have done, but to make sure that it gets in. Now, this is complicated because you need the Egyptians, the Israelis, and Hamas to agree to this. But hopefully all will agree to get the aid in to the Palestinian people. So, Senator, President Biden is going to address the nation tonight, talking to Americans about the need to support Israel, but more than Israel, also Ukraine as well. And White House aides have suggested they're going to put together a funding request, could be up to $100 billion for those two nations, as well as Taiwan and border security. So let's get your assessment here. Is that an, an appropriate figure to ask for? And do you think it could pass through the Congress? Well, I think it can pass through the Senate. As an appropriate level, level you want to see what it's going to break down to. Uh, we are told that $60 billion is what the Ukrainians need, as opposed to just giving the Ukrainians a little here and a little there and a little there, that $60 billion is what they would need for some time to come, so there'll be no more ask of Congress. Now, certainly the border, the southern border of Mexico, we need help there. Not just money, but policy to try and keep this influx from being so crazy. Um, as regards um, uh, passing, I think it'll pass. It'll pass the Senate. Now, obviously, the House doesn't have a speaker. Um, uh, but I think that the package together would pass. But again, I, I can't really predict what's going to happen in the House right now. <laughs> None of us can, Senator. None of his can. Um, well, speaking of the house, well, yeah, why don't I, we just ask? I, I, I'm curious. I know it's really not your your yeah. your business. Uh, I, I am wondering though whether you would like to see somebody like uh, Representative uh, McHenry uh, take over the speakership at least temporarily through the end of the year, so you all could get business done. 
I think Patrick would be a great temporary speaker. I'm not sure he wants it. <laughs> Who would? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah. I, th I think I think he's respected by all sides. That's probably why McCarthy uh, selected him in the first place. And things have to get done. We've just talked about these these things, but the border is part of this. We've got to address the fact that I think 7 million people have come across our southern border illegally since President Biden took office. Among those are now people who are on our terrorist watch list. This has to be addressed. Um, so I think Patrick has that respect and the ability to work with all sides. And the fact that he doesn't want it probably probably would recommend him to those who, uh, okay, he's temporary, but we can fight it out later. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Republican Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, thank you very much for coming on Morning Joe this morning. Thank you. Thank you all. Last year, that's according to new numbers from the U.S. Census Bureau. And now a new study is showing one way the increased costs are affecting women in particular. It's called period poverty. And Morgan Radford joins us now with more details. Morgan, this affects a lot more women than people might think. Mika, you're absolutely right. It's a problem that's personal, but it's also becoming increasingly political. Just like basic food and energy costs, the cost of period products like tampons or pads, they're also something that many women have to budget for. In fact, a new study has found that nearly one in three American women have been unable to afford or access those very period products when they need them most, which is why a national nonprofit called Dignity Grows is stepping in, hoping to end period poverty once and for all. The so-called tampon tax. Access to menstrual products. We'll remove sales tax from our period products. After years of silence, the issue of menstruation is becoming political. In the last two years alone, five states have voted to make feminine hygiene products tax exempt, bringing the total number of states with tax-free tampons and pads to 24. And this year, Representative Grace Meng of New York reintroduced the Menstrual Equity for All Act, a bill that would help students, incarcerated people, and those on Medicaid have access to free period products. It's a change college freshman Janiah Lumpkin says is long overdue. Okay, you have your period now. You still have to work. You still have to go to school. But it's like, if you don't have those products, then you literally, you physically cannot. It's a phenomenon known as period poverty, lack of access to basic menstrual hygiene supplies like tampons or pads, which is why Janaya started volunteering with a nonprofit called Dignity Grows, <laughs> which helps in an even more direct way, holding packing parties like these, where hundreds of volunteers fill tote bags with a month-long supply of hygiene products, all given away for free. We have toothpaste, toothbrush, soap, deodorant, maxi pads, hand wipes, panty liners, and shampoo. CEO Jessica Zach says these products have already reached the hands of 160,000 people. It is a very taboo subject still, and it is a subject that not only affects women, it affects families and communities. It's not just a woman's pro problem. A new study commissioned by the organization found nearly one in three American women has been impacted by period poverty in their lifetime, an obstacle that 75% of women say affected other parts of their lives, like work, school, and even their mental health. What is the feedback you've been getting to all of this? We got a letter from a young woman that said, I'm the first person in my family to go to college. I haven't missed school since I've been getting Dignity Gross Totes. Wow. What's better than that? When you see a woman like Janaya who is outspoken about this issue, does it give you more hope for the future? I'm at an age now when women weren't, didn't speak so much. But this is a generation of activists and advocates, and it gives me absolute hope for the future. A future with fewer obstacles for the next generation. Dignity Grows has 60 chapters spread across 27 states, and they work with local providers like food pantries and homeless shelters to identify the people who are most in need. And one thing they stress to us that these tote bags, they're not meant to be a one-time handout, but rather a steady supply mm -hmm. of products that women can really rely on consistently. Mika? So this is great, Morgan. Even with all the progress women have made, what are the challenges uh, that groups doing work like this still face? Is there still sort of like a stigma around it? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, that stigma is one of their biggest challenges. And frankly, to be honest, you know, I grew up in the South. This wasn't something that we talked about openly, you know, for my parents' generation or, or certainly mine. But we are seeing more lawmakers like Representative Mang here out of New York, even Republican lawmakers down in Texas. They're trying to take action mm. on this issue because so many people, the group's founder says, you know, they're, they're trying to break down the data, the stigma. And so when they look at the data and they hear that, for example, one in three women is affected by this, it doesn't become a women's problem anymore, as you heard her say. This becomes Correct. a human problem. And when people understand this is a human problem, it's no longer sidelined. And that stigma finally starts to break. Mika. All right, NBC's Morgan Radford, thank you very much for that report. We appreciate it. During his trip to Israel yesterday, President Biden participated in an emotional meeting with the families of those missing after the Hamas terror attack and also with first responders. That includes Eli Beer. He's the founder and president of United Hatzalah, the largest independent nonprofit fully volunteer emergency medical service organization based in Israel. Since the attacks, the group's volunteer medics have been on the front lines in Israel responding to life-saving calls. We have uh, 7,000 first responders, United Hatzalah, who are spread around Israel. Our response is usually 90 seconds, and we were there in the first moments seeing the atrocities that happened. We saw women that were raped and then murdered, children, little babies that were torn around, tur 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 take it away from their parents, murdered in front of their parents, heads chopped off. Our volunteers were brave. We have two volunteers who were murdered. And Ellie Beer joins us now. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show to share with us uh, your stories and concerns. I want to first ask, I listened to that conversation you had with President Biden yesterday, and you, you talked to him about Biden helping a bit, just a bit, lift the spirit of Israel. How important do you think it was that he came? Well, I think this was the greatest thing that happened to Israel in many years, uh, uplifting the spirit of the people living in the south of Israel that have bombarded for the last 20 years by hundreds of thousands of missiles that are coming from Gaza. And the world was just ignoring it. And unfortunately, this, this massacre that happened in the south of Israel, it hit every family in Israel, it hit everyone knows someone who was either murdered, kidnapped, or injured. And every Israeli feels like his family was hit. And all of a sudden, the most important president of the world, of the, in the world, the president of the United States, comes to visit Israel and just to support and show love. I think this uplifted the spirit of every Israeli, no matter Jew or non-Jew, Christian and Muslims and Jews, and every Jew around the world, or, or anyone who loves Israel, their spirit was uplifted yesterday. Mr. Beer, let me, um, let me ask you about uh, how the Israeli people are doing um, a few weeks after this just absolutely heinous attack. I I was talking to a friend a few weeks ago who said he felt like this generation had let down Holocaust survivors. You remember talking to his grandparents that people who had survived Auschwitz and, and other camps didn't like to talk. He said when he was growing up, they didn't like to talk about it. And they'd, they'd, fade, they'd, they'd, they'd fade off and then they'd always sort of snap back to and they'd say, at least we're here. We're here now. Israel is here now. We are safe. Talk about how that belief was so shattered and how the Israelis are rebuilding uh, in, in just this, in, in the wake of this unspeakable tragedy. Well, we treated, unfortunately, the worst of the worst, we were right there. Our volunteers of United Hatzel were there in the kibbutzim, in the little villages. We had a twins baby, twin babies, six month old, that were hiding together with their parents in a shelter. And after two hours of hiding from the terrorists, and the terrorists were trying to break into the house, they felt, the parents felt like they need to go out to get some food for the babies that were starving. 
And the mother ran out to just get a little food for the baby or a little water. And the terrorist jumped on her and raped her. And then when the father came to save her, he, they shot him and killed him. And then they killed the mother. And the two little babies were left for 16 hours in that little room, crying for 16 hours while the terrorists ran to kill other people in the community. Literally 60% of that little kibbutz were murdered in the most brutal way. And these little babies were set, found by us and by the special forces in Israel. And my volunteer, Shalom, who was holding this little baby, and the other baby was held by another volunteer, he told me he felt like he was a partisan in 1943 in Europe. That's how we felt. I met little children. I was looking for their parents, and afterwards we found out their parents were murdered. This felt like we were in the Holocaust. We felt like we were literally... You're talking about over 1,500 people were murdered, children, babies, women, old people, Holocaust survivors. We had a Holocaust survivor that we took to the hospital. The Holocaust survivors couldn't stop crying. A number on their arm from Auschwitz. Two of his, that Holocaust survivor was two of their grandchildren were murdered in Israel. In Israel in, in 2023, Holocaust survivors going through this. United Atzala, we went through 35, I, w I went through 35 years of service on ambulances. I'm a first responder for, for my whole life. And I seen the bomb attacks and I seen the shooting and I saw wars. If I combine all of these together for my whole 35 years of volunteering, if I put all of it together, it wouldn't be even 10% of what I saw in one day in October 7th. That's how we all felt. And that's why we feel personally that our, our life's not the same. It's not the same. There was an Ellie beer before October 7th, and there was an Ellie beer after right. that. So was, I am a different person. Yeah, Ellie, um, how um, you, you, you talked about how these babies were left crying for 16 hours. You were a first responder. You were on the front line. Other brave Israelis were. We heard the story of the retired general who at 67 got off of a bike ride that morning, got a gun, went down, got some troops together, and actually did, did many rescues. There are so many stories of heroism. But have you, have you figured out, have Israelis um, pieced together how it could be that it took the military so long to come down four five six seven ten hours to come down and 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 rescue israelis who are under siege well if you think about christmas morning at 6 30 in the morning think about christmas morning that's that's how simchat torah was it's like one of the holiest holidays of the year and they purposely chosen that day this this was well planned by Iran and, and Hezbollah and Hamas, of course, that uh, uh, th this wasn't just a, a, a random thing. This was well planned for a long time um, to do a lot more. They were literally planning to go to Jerusalem. And the army is not a first responder. We are first responders. The police are first responders. Army takes right. hours and hours to prepare for war. Now, the army bases that are there, most of the soldiers well, off. My son is in the military, special forces in the IDF. My son was out of the army that weekend. They all send him home for the weekend to be with their families for the holiday. And I feel like this was a well, this was an incredible job of Iran to literally kill every Israeli. This was a plan to go into Jerusalem, into Tel Aviv. They didn't have the security we thought. I mean, unfortunately, this was a, a terrible tragedy that happened to Israel and. I really hope we learn a lot from this. Um, but I could just tell you about two heroes of United Hatzalah, an Arab United Hatzalah volunteer, a Muslim. And he was from Nazareth. He came for that party, that festival that was a dance party for young kids. He was there as a standby paramedic in case something happens. And when the shooting started, he's an Arab Israeli wearing this Hatzalah jacket with, the, with this Israeli flag on it. And he ran to save people. They had a young girl that he was trying to save. She was shot all over. And the terrorists caught him. And when they realized he's an Arab and he's an Israeli, they tortured him so much. 
We couldn't recognize him when we found him. Four days later, we found him. We couldn't recognize him. He was one hero. He he didn't run away. He stayed with the with the victims he was trying to save. And the second one is a volunteer, a Jewish volunteer from Kriyam Malachi. When he heard this is going on and the missiles were flying above his head, he left the shelter with his family, went in his car, and he ran to save lives. We had the most incredible heroes. I met, and I am lucky to be here in Israel and to serve the people here in this time, together with 7,000 other United Hatzalah volunteers and many others who came. And I would say this is a tragedy that will take generations to, to forget about. We're, not, we're never going to forget. This is something that's going to be for the rest of our lives. But oh. this was also a very big miracle, and people don't realize what a big miracle this was, because they were 2,900 terrorists who ramped into Israel with bazookas, with with machine guns and 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 anything any ammunition you could think of, and they came in and they got bombarded with the women that they were raping. If they were not busy, unfortunately, with raping women, they would have continued to Jerusalem. When they saw all that party with the young kids, they literally stopped their their act. And I think about how how much they suffered. All these. It, you can't even imagine these little kids, 20 year old, 22 year old, were dancing, having a nice time. It was a peaceful event. It ended up in the most, in the biggest tragedy we ever had in Israel. And I salute to anyone who was helping. We had an incredible first responders there. People put their lives. Unfortunately, two of our volunteers were, were murdered. We have two others who were kidnapped and with their wives, with their spouses. And we have eight volunteers who were seriously injured in this event. Mm. Oh, my God. Founder and president of United Hatzalah, Ellie Beer, thank you so much for what you're doing. And thank you for sharing your stories with us here this morning. I want to thank you. I, I really feel like the, Amer the president, the United States president, I'm an American, too. And I felt so proud to be an American and proud of your show that you're showing what's going on. And many, many people are supporting now from medical equipment here in Israel. And people ask me all the time, how do we support? Just go on United Outside. It's IsraelRescue.org and support saving lives here in Israel. Thank you. And here's more. And here's more of what President Biden had to say yesterday in Tel Aviv, something that had echoes of a message from Holocaust survivor, the late Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel. October 7th, which was sacred to a sacred Jewish holiday became the deadliest day for the Jewish people since the Holocaust. The world watched then, it knew, and the world did nothing. We will not stand by and do nothing again. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. Wherever and whenever a project even similar or close to similar to that project that Hitler had for the Jews and some other people, we must immediately do whatever we can to stop it, to denounce it first, to disarm the perpetrators to be, and to create a world in which their project could not come to fruition. That is Elie Wiesel. A decade ago, he dedicated his life to making sure never again truly meant never again. Joining us now is his son, Alicia Wiesel. He's chairman of the Elie Wiesel Foundation. Also with us, Israel's special envoy for combating anti-terrorism, Mikhail kotler Wunsch. Thank you both for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, Alicia, I want to begin with you because we just heard the, the words of your father. Um, and speak, if you would, to the significance of the president going to Tel Aviv yesterday, to physically being there in addition to the week and a half or nearly two weeks now of unequivocal American support for Israel here. Of course, and thank you so much for having us on the show. Um, when my father passed in 2016, then Vice President Biden put out a statement and the statement said, there is a promise that needs to be made to remember what his friend and teacher, Elie Wiesel, had said, never again, and that it was a promise that should be deep in the hearts of good people everywhere. And you have to realize tens of thousands of school children in this country are reading night, and it is coming to life before their very eyes. And there are going to be evil people that are not only committing the deeds, the Hamas terrorists took selfies and videos. You have the leaders of Hamas coming on Russian TV declaring why they did it. You have the indifferent 
You have school administrations on universities twisting themselves to avoid condemning the evil of Hamas, trying to both sides this issue and establish moral equivalence between Israel and Hamas. And then you also have heroes. You have unbelievable moral courage exhibited by President Biden. It is clear that when President Biden made that promise in his statement, as my father departed the world, it is a promise that he intends on keeping. And you think about the incredible moral courage that it takes. The Holocaust did not happen in a vacuum. The Holocaust is the, the, the culmination of over a thousand years of blood libel against the Jews. You think about the poisoned well claims. You think about Christian babies that the pogroms would trot out and say, the Jews did this, we have to go kill them. What do you think is happening now? Look at the reaction that happened when Israel was falsely accused of bombing a hospital. It's very easy to say never again, but to face up to the angry mob and say, no, you're incorrect. I hate to tell you, it was the other team. That is unbelievable moral courage. So my big hope, if you, if you think about the world that these students who are all reading night right now, as they watch congressmen like Rashida Tlaib spout the blood libel, refuse to take it back, the danger that that puts Jewish people in across the world, here in the United States, and in Israel, and then you think about the unbelievable moral clarity that President Biden has had, there are unbelievable examples for our students to learn from right now. And in fact, she doubled down on that claim at a rally later in the day <clears throat> yesterday. Uh, Mikhail, from where you're sitting, from Israel's point of view, I was watching you listen to the interview. Joe and Mika just had the extraordinary interview there with Ellie Beer and the emotion is raw and the world feels your anguish and your pain, but we can never understand it from the perspective that you have. What can you say to an American audience about how Israelis are feeling right now? Well, it's actually why I got on a plane as Israel's special envoy for combating anti-Semitism that has my own three children in the army as we speak. And I want to share with you that the entire Israeli society is deployed to this war, whether on the home front command, as Eli Beer just reported, there is a war or on the front fighting what is continues to be this onslaught, this war that began on October 7th. Something very, very important, and Alicia Wiesel was not only a friend and a dear beloved member of our own family in many, many ways, but that never again understanding. Never again is now. Never again understands that the very same anti-Semitism that fueled the massacre of October 7th the covenant of Hamas, which, like Mein Kampf, calls for the annihilation of the state of Israel and the murder of Jews. That very same assault was enabled by anti-Semitism, but it also is the same anti-Semitism that enables those that deny or excuse or justify the atrocities, the war crimes, the crimes against humanity that we saw right here in protest in New York, in protests all over the world, on campuses, on social media. And so we have to be very clear, there would be no one that would call for a ceasefire with Nazis. There would be no one that would spout or peddle the information given to them by Nazis as fact-checked information apropos the hospital and what happened the other day. There would be nobody that would say, I am a Nazi in protests in New York City hold up, holding up signs. Anybody who holds up those signs that say, I am Hamas, is holding up a sign saying, I am ISIS. Just like September 11th was the day that we will never forget right here in this city. And just like nobody would hold up a sign saying, I am a Nazi. And that moral clarity and courage that has to be not only by the President of the United States, by, by, but by every single individual that recognizes that this is an assault on our shared humanity. It is war on our civilization. It may be the Jew or the Jewish nation state that is now on the front, but we are all on the front lines. And that is why I got on this plane to make that urgent call and to make this as relevant as possible to those that think that the world maybe will go back to what it was before October 7th, but it can't for never again again to mean anything. Alicia, a moment ago, we were discussing everything that's been going on in this country. And as you put it, the masks have come off so many people, people who may have cloaked their anti-Semitism in different ways now are just outright putting it on full display. Members of Congress, uh, campus groups. If you go outside synagogues in New York City right now, you have New York City police officers in tactical gear because they need to be. And there are protests of Israel 
who were just the victims of a horrible terrorist attack. So how do you make sense of that and how do you fight that? Look, we have a very deep corruption, unfortunately, in our universities in this country. You know, for a long time, people have wondered, what is it that's ultimately blocking peace in the Middle East? And one of the things that we know is that there is still hate being taught in Palestinian textbooks. You have a generation that is being raised on hate. But the sad truth is, it's not just there. It's happening here. You have professors such as at Cornell and Columbia, Yale University. You have, you have student bodies that are, you, know, you, have, you have professors that are, that are celebrating this, saying it was an extraordinary day. It was awesome. It was exhilarating. You have student bodies like at Harvard, where 30 to 40 student groups you know, were very determined to only blame Israel for what's going on. And the thought that this is happening after you know, so many years of social justice movements awakening in this country, where the very same Jewish people that marched for Black Lives Matter are now opening their eyes and they're like, how is it possible that these people who we stood with are blaming the victim? Blaming the victim is the one big thing that you are not supposed to do. And here we are in that state. This is gonna have to be a wake up call. And significant donors are reevaluating their relationships to these universities because they want to know what happened here and why is my money supporting hatred against the Jewish people. So, Mikhail, long before October 7th, there was already in recent years a rise in hate crimes, a rise in anti Semitism here in the United States, also in Europe, throughout the globe. What is your level of concern that that hatred could only increase as the situation in the Middle East deteriorates and the war gets even hotter? So it not only can increase, it is increasing. We see Jews targeted in their homes. We see Jewish homes in Berlin being marked with uh, stars of David. We see protests that actually, in fact, call for these violence. If they cannot condemn it, then they endorse it against Jews right here in New York City. And I want to say, continuing what Alicia just said, there is a definition of anti-Semitism. It's the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition. It is critical that we recognize and hold to account and understand that the modern strain of anti-Semitism, an ever mutating virus that enabled the atrocities of the Holocaust and of October 7th, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. There is no ifs, buts, or so's. All of those institutions, all of those law enforcement mechanisms, all of those um, um, capable of understanding universities have to be able to not just say we are committed to combat anti-Semitism, because you can't combat something without first defining it. Anti-Semitism, an ever-mutating virus, has enabled this modern mainstream form, that the form of anti-Zionism, to enable not only the savage attacks, but their legitimization on our campuses, online, and in all kinds of spaces. So there is what to do, but it's a call to action. It no longer is enough to say we are committed to combating. You cannot identify or combat anything without first defining it. And when Alicia says the masks are off, the masks are off in every realm for all of us. It is clear that anti-Zionism and the lack of acceptance of Israel's right to exist in any borders is the modern mainstream form of anti-Semitism that we have to identify and combat together. And as you say, it's right. We don't have to wonder what Hamas's goal is. It's right in the charter. They put it in writing, the elimination of the state of Israel. We are joined right now by the White House Principal Deputy National Security Advisor John Feiner. Thanks for being on. What can we expect to hear from the president uh, tonight? Uh, well, thanks for having me. I think you'll hear tonight uh, the president describe uh, this perilous uh, moment that we are in globally when it comes uh, to our national security, when it comes to international uh, stability, highlighting in particular, obviously, uh, the ongoing uh, brutal conflict in Ukraine, uh, where the United States is standing uh, shoulder to shoulder with a number of our, our allies in support of the Ukrainians uh, who have been uh, invaded, obviously, uh, by their neighbor in a flagrant violation of international law. He will also uh, speak uh, more to the conflict conflict uh, that is raging now in, in Gaza and to the horrific terrorist attack that our ally Israel uh, has suffered uh, in, in, in uh, at the president's visit yesterday, uh, obviously highlighting that message of solidarity. But this will also be very much a message to the American people, how those uh, conflicts uh, connect to our lives uh, back here, how support uh, from the American people uh, and the Congress, frankly, is essential to maintaining this national leadership uh, that the United States is showing uh, to, to steer these conflicts in the best possible direction. John, the president also announced $100 million in aid to Gaza, in addition to the 
the support for Israel to Gaza uh, and citizens who are suffering right now in a humanitarian crisis. Uh, are you confident, as those trucks mass at the border there that we've been talking about this morning in Rafa, are you confident that that humanitarian aid, that's a lot of taxpayer money, will get to the right people and will not be intercepted by Hamas as so much aid is? Uh, we believe those trucks will get into Gaza over the course of the next uh, day or so. Uh, the president has also been quite clear, uh, though, that if we see that aid uh, being uh, misappropriated, being taken uh, essentially uh, by Hamas uh, for its own purposes, that that will affect the continued distribution of, of assistance. And so uh, he sent a strong message that this aid needs to get to the Palestinian people uh, in Gaza, to civilians in Gaza, uh, that this is not uh, some sort of support program uh, for fighters. And we will see how that unfolds. But that was a major focus of the president's visit to Israel and the diplomacy that he did uh, by phone with President al-Sisi and others uh, in the region yesterday. All right, White House Principal Deputy National Security Advisor John Finer, thank you very much. We'll be watching the president tonight.